You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. Two weeks ago, the Chinese central government announced the latest in its crackdowns after its crackdowns on China's big tech, big finance, and big education companies. This was aimed at something massive. The massively online multiplayer games, one of the many kinds of games that are played right now. This crackdown was aimed specifically at young people under the age of 18, who are a big part of the estimated 665 million people playing online games in China. But it's going to have a much deeper impact than forcing teenagers to find a new pastime. Welcome to the Inside China podcast. My name is Xin Mei Shen. In the past 10 years, the growth of gaming in China has been nothing short of exponential. China's gaming industry is estimated to have turned over 32 billion US dollars last year. And it's not just about kids hunched over their PCs, phones, or tablets grinding their way through the levels. The growth of esports as a spectator sport is through the roof. Four years ago, the estimated audience in China who watched professional gamers battle it out on their screens was 335 million viewers. And those numbers were forecast to almost double for next year. Three years ago, there was one single stadium in Shanghai hosting esports tournaments. Now, dedicated professional esports teams own their own stadiums in multiple cities across China, very much like NBA and NFL teams in the U.S. And China was among the first countries in the world to create schools dedicated to video gaming, where students come to be trained by professional players on the tricks of the trade and how to rise through the ranks to themselves becoming professional gamers. So what happens now? What happens when China's state media come out and label online gaming as spiritual opium that must be stopped? My colleague here on the tech desk is Josh Ye. He's been following this story as it develops. So Josh, take us back. What happened on Monday, August 30? So yeah, so that day, um, you know, the NAPP, the National Administration of Press and Publication, announced that players under the age of 18 can only play games for about three hours a week. And more significantly, uh, specify a specific window of time during which you can play, which is between 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And, you know, beyond those times, you are limited. By that, I mean they are only allowed to play between 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. So, you know, it's a very specific window of time during which you can play. It goes to show that they are really serious about cracking down on minors, you know, game addiction and a lot of attendant problems. So it really set off a lot of panic uh, in the market as well as, you know, among gamers community. So how are the restrictions going to work exactly? Are, is there some sort of um, system put in place or is it on the parents to do it? The enforcement of it lies you know, primarily in the gaming companies, right? So um, you know, the gaming companies are the one that put on the hot seat to do this. Um, technologically, the way they apply it is through a real name registration uh, system that have been talked about and trying to implement for years. In order to access the games, you will have to log in with an account that is tied with the police database, which has you know, all your information and such. Josh, we just want to clarify for our listeners, so all teenagers are on the police database? Yeah, so every citizen has you know their national ID, right? And then these national IDs are tied into the police database, so everybody sort of you know whereabouts and you know, where to go to school and all those things you know were recorded from day one, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. So let's say you want to play League of Legends, right? In order to log into the game, you will have to have an account and your know, password and all those things. Obviously, you can't have an account you know if you don't have a national ID that is tied into the police system. So that's the way through which they're trying to implement this. Um, there were also talks about how to better enforce this by use of you know maybe facial recognition. Um, this idea has been floated about uh, since two three years ago, but you know it turns out it's pretty hard to do. Um, they have done some you know, pilot programs here and there, but then there haven't been a sort of a widespread uh, implementation of this yet. When you first reported on this, your sources were saying that it would drive more young players to unregulated foreign games and platforms such as Steam. It's been two weeks. Are you seeing any of that happening? 
Yeah, so that is the sort of the general direction where things are going, you know, according to people I know and analysts and all those. So it's been two weeks, and we are, you know, still chasing to、uh, see how people react to this, right? So、um, I guess you know, it's the jury is still out about you know how this is gonna 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 play out. But there are historical sort of precedents that we can sort of reference, right? Between 2000 and 2015, console gaming was banned in China, right? So when that happened,、uh, you see a lot of the console gamers turn to the black market and the gray market to access their games. So imported, parallel imported consoles as well as console games were, you know, sold、um, by sort of you know these underground merchants. And a lot of people blame the console gaming ban for. Driving the market underground, and that led to a lot of problems, such as the proliferation of counterfeits, you know, hacked consoles, as well as a lot of the circumvention tools that that really hurt、uh, the game developers more so than anybody else, because people know that you know developing games for Chinese audience, they ain't gonna get their money back.、Uh, they they know that they're not gonna really make money from it. Because you know the black market is just too vibrant. Josh, you just mentioned circumvention tools.、Um, I'm wondering if there is an increasing use of VPNs. So, what has you know become increasingly popular among gamers were these you know effective gaming dedicated VPNs. They're not all the way VPNs that allow you ac- to access YouTube or Facebook and all these foreign websites. But then they do allow you to hop into foreign servers. For specific games, again, using League of Legends as an example,、uh, some of the gamers they may not want to be limited to be playing with Chinese、uh, gamers only, especially esports, you know, athletes. You know, they want to train with the best, right? They want to, you know, play elsewhere. That's how they、uh, do it. The way they do it is through using these gaming VPNs. And originally, this is a sort of a very niche market, but increasingly, it's becoming more and more、uh, widely adopted. So whenever there is a popular game that is not accessible in China because of all the restrictions, you see that you know some of these gaming VPNs apps will spike in in their download traffic. More significantly, you also see some of the big gaming companies. I'm talking about NetEase and Tencent. These guys have also built up their own gaming VPNs because it's a bit tricky here. Let, let, let's talk about. Nintendo Switch. You know, Nintendo Switch is available in China through a tie-up with Tencent. But the reality is that because a lot of the games are not approved by the Chinese government, so the Chinese version of Nintendo only had about a handful of games. You know, when during the first you know six months of launch. So obviously, that's not going to make a lot of people want to buy these consoles. As such, you know, these VPNs come in to help gamers to access those games that they really want to play. So it's、uh, evolving cat and mouse games between you know gamers and regulators and sometimes even the game publishers them themselves operating in you know different sort of gray area and figure out how to best you know benefit from the situation. So can we talk a bit more about esports,、uh, which is not just the professional gaming for prize money, but also the audiences who watch it live in stadiums or、uh, streamed online?、Uh, what are the impact of the new rules on that? So the impact of this role on esports is huge. So let me point you to one example. The biggest esports star in China was Uzi, before he retired last year at the age of 23. He started his esports career at age 15, right? So this is impossible to almost continue given the new ban. So in response to the new rule, all these big tournaments, especially the ones organized by Tencent, they said that they're gonna raise. The age limit for all the esports athletes eligible for competition. Before that, China is really publicly, you know, saying that they're trying to be the esports superpower in the world. Right now, we are expecting esports to be played on international stage. You know, recently, the Hangzhou Asian Games, you know, which is about to happen next year, will include esports as a medal sport for the first time. But now, this new rule sort of throw everything into a bit of disarray. Imagine you are like a youth league, you know, soccer players, and you can only play three hours a week to train. That's impossible, right? You know, it takes fifteen, twenty minutes to warm up.、Um, you know, take fifteen minutes to just talk about strategies, and you're done. So this is impossible、uh, in many, in so many different ways. But the gaming companies would just have to comply because you know this comes straight from Beijing. And now this affects not 
just the estimated 665 million gamers in mainland China. There's also been a crackdown on the gaming industry itself, uh, which made some 32 billion U.S. dollars last year. Uh, could you tell us what happened there? So every company is now busy trying to implement and sort, sort of incorporate the anti-addiction features into their games. And before that can happen, nothing you know, is really sort of moving along the process. Nothing is really moving along the pipeline. Uh, we have sources telling us that the approval process for new games has been significantly slowed because you know, all these different priorities. While it is not like 2018, where game approvals straight up came to a halt because you know, at the time it was because of a government overhaul, now it is because you know, some priorities take precedence over others. Now we're expecting a whole lot fewer games to be coming to China in the coming months, if not you know, for a longer period of time. You just briefly mentioned that this is not the first freeze of uh, game approval in China. There was one in 2018 as well, which lasted for eight months. Could you talk a bit more about how that one was different? So the approval freeze in 2018 lasted for about nine months, actually. Mm -hmm. And about 28,000 gaming companies went under because of that, because so much of their revenue depends on getting new games approved and all those things. Again, we are not saying that you know, this is the same as 2018, but then if things did prolong, we would have on our hand a messy situation for sure. So this is certainly a hit on, the, uh, on game development, but is it all bad news? What are uh, you hearing from the game industry? What about parents? Are, they, are any of them happy about this? Right. So on the parents' feedback side of things, I think, you know, the feedback's a bit mixed in China. And let's talk about China for now. So in China, a lot of the parents are gamers themselves. So this is, you know, kind of the unpleasant history that they live through, right? Uh, some of them are not liking this very much. But then obviously, there's a significant portion of people who are concerned about their children being addicted to a game. So among those people, they are cheering this ban on. So yeah, I read some you know, messages on Weibo, uh, China's you know, equivalent of Twitter, right? They're saying some really interesting comments. You know, one parent said that now this ban gives him a whole lot more leverage over his kids, right? You know, if, if, if my son agrees to you know, do this chore for me, I will allow him to use my account to play these games. We are seeing these kind of mixed response. Also, some parents are worried that now their kids can play video games. You know, what are they going to do? Because digital services have become an important babysitting tool for a lot of parents. And now they are like, if they can't play games, they're just going to come bother me. What are we going to deal with that? All of this just goes to show that gaming has become very mainstream, that I feel like sometimes a straight-up ban have unintended consequences that are kind of hard to deal with. And the regulators are aware of that, you know, to be sure. Um, they know that this is hard to enforce, but then for them, the priority is really to crack down on uh, the tech giants as well as miners getting addicted to games. And, of course, uh, gaming has a big international community. What about overseas reactions? So the international response to this is interesting, right? You know, on the surface of it, some people think that, you know, it's good that Chinese government is cracking down on games because, you know, they kept running into um, Chinese gamers. But ironically, Beijing's crackdown on gaming actually will drive more uh, Chinese gamers, you know, to oversee uh, servers such that, you know, they will be actually running into, you know, Chinese gamers more and more. Chances are you may be running into, you know, Chinese gamers on Call of Duty servers, you know, increasingly more often because, you know, these gamers are coming to U.S. soil to play, you know, obviously virtually um, because, you know, gaming in China is significantly limited. There's still a lot more to the story and we'll be following your coverage. Where can we find you? Obviously, you know, you want to follow my stories, you can go on SCMP, you can find my author page, you know, it has all my stories there. And also, I'm on Twitter, so my handle is the real Josh Ye. And Josh, what's the game that you're playing the most right now? Oh, like I'm now I'm really get I'm really getting hooked on Splitgate, which is kind of like Halo meets Portal. Uh, it's a multiplayer shooter. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for your time, Josh. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's all for this week's Inside China. It's great to be back after our short break. If you want to hear more about the other side of gaming in China what happens when young people are diagnosed as addicted to online gaming, 
Check the description of this podcast for a link to our deep dive podcast into what it's like inside a Chinese internet addiction treatment center. There's a lot more to come on this story, so don't forget you'll get the latest news analysis from all of us on the SCMP Tech Team at scmp.com, and you can follow the team on Twitter as well at SCMP Tech. My name is Xin Mei Shen. Thanks for listening, and for all you gamers in the U.S., Australia, and everywhere else outside China, best of luck. The Chinese teenagers are coming for you. Bye for now. Acast recommends more podcasts, more episodes, more great shows. Keep listening to hear a new show we recommend. In a home in the suburbs, a boy dreamed of saving all the poor children of the world. He built a charity that attracted the world's top celebrities. Hey, I'm Justin Bieber, and this is Rita. This has become your life's work. But behind the scenes, things started popping up. Allegations about corruption, blackmail. This is the story of a charity that did well when it was supposed to be doing good. The White Saviors, a Canadaland original podcast. A cash, a cash, a cash, a cash recommends. recommends.